Yep, I think I'm on. Lovely. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. A very warm welcome to UCL and to the Bartlett. Um, my name's Professor Jackie Glass. I'm Professor of Construction Management in the School of Construction and Project Management here. And it's my pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker. Thank you all very much for coming along this evening and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Um, just before I introduce our speaker, um, I just need to do some housekeeping with you if that's okay. Um, the first item, of course, is fire safety. Now, we're not expecting a fire alarm test at this time of the evening, of course. Um, so if you do hear the fire alarm, um, please leave the building and go across the street in Gordon Street, just to the other side of the road where the assembly point is. Um, if you're looking for the bathrooms, they are just out of this door and along the corridor, not too far. And to warn you that we are actually live streaming tonight's presentation lecture. Um, we'll be recording it and there may also be some photography going on. So if you're concerned that um, we may have taken a photograph of you and you're not happy about that, then please speak to my colleague Michelle at the back, just here, um, uh, directly and personally. Thank you. Um, after the presentation, we will have a drinks reception. You're all more than welcome to join us. We will be just across the hall in room 604. Um, as you can see, people will be joining us a little bit towards the start of the session, but do come on in and welcome. So, a very warm welcome to our colleague from across the pond. Welcome back to Dr. G. Edward Gibson, uh, Ed, to his friends. Um, welcome, Ed. Um, he's come across from uh, Arizona State University, and he's actually on a temporary stay at the moment as a visiting academic fellow at the University of Cambridge at the Langer Rock Centre, which some of you will know of construction engineering. Um, now, we've worked out, Ed, haven't we, that we met many years ago at a joint uh, CII, Construction Industry Institute, and European Construction Institute event at London Heathrow. Um, and I think that was an event where we heard presentations from Andrew Wollstenholm of Crossrail and Michel Velogeur, who was in charge of the, uh, the, the Milau Viaduct, of course. Major projects. And I think some of the things we're going to be talking about this evening, Ed, will be very pertinent to major projects. So you'll have read Ed's biography, I'm sure. But just to let you know, here is somebody with an immense amount of experience and lessons to share with us tonight. He was the power behind some of the really influential construction planning tools that CII have produced over the years. So his tools have influenced many major projects across the world. We're delighted to have him here as part of his visit to the UK. And particularly, I think, Ed, you, know, you embody a lot of what you might call the expertise behind good construction management because you have an engineering background. And actually, we are always looking for people from cross-disciplinary backgrounds, and we have to be alert to management and engineering factors in our work, I think. So, Ed, I'd like to invite you to give your lecture this evening. I'm going to hand over the microphone to you just shortly. Could I ask you to hold your questions until the end of the session, when we'll have a microphone that we will be able to pass around to you? I'll just uh, hand over the microphone to you now, Ed, if that's okay. Just to remind you, those who've just come in, that we are live streaming tonight. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Patrick, are we okay? You're good? All right. Let me get this going. A um, <clears throat> few things. Number one, thank you very much for the nice introduction, Jackie. It's certainly a pleasure to be here this evening. Um, and it's been a pleasure to be in England for about the last three months. I've really enjoyed being over here. I've learned a lot. And uh, I'm leaving and going back to the U.S. next week. I'll be in Arizona uh, just in time for the first 100 degree Fahrenheit day. So it should be perfect timing from where I'm, I'm from. Um, <clears throat> as Jackie said, I'm, I've been over here for a few weeks and I've learned a lot. I'm from Arizona State University in Tempe, Arizona, and um, I've been a faculty member for a number of years. And so I'm going to talk to you tonight about 
uh, a subject that's near and dear to my heart, and I'll kind of give you an explanation of why it is that, that, it, that it is near and dear to my heart, and, and hopefully give you some high-level things that you can take away from here to help you in your journey toward more effective project plans. And so without any further, we'll get going. So I've got a rhetorical question here, and I'm not really going to ask for any answers. I think you can probably come up with 10 answers per person in here. We could, we could fill a board with it. But so what makes one project more successful than another? And when I started this journey looking at the front end planning process now in 1991, going on now in, into the 29th year of looking at this, and I'll explain that a little bit later, we were looking at what factors early in the project can help you become more successful. And so as I go through this journey tonight and we kind of talk through what we've done over the past years, and I say we because many grad students and many industry participants, um, many people have made all of this a reality, I think we'll co keep coming back to some of these things that I think you can take away that, that provide that value. So a long time ago in a universe far, far away, um, I was, I had darker hair, um, I was younger, um, I got a research project and uh, that was around 1991-ish or so and it was to look at this thing called pre-project planning and it was by the Construction Industry Institute, and they wanted us to determine what were the factors. Number one, well, first of all, does good early planning or pre-project planning lead to better results? Because no one had really published anything or there was very little that had been published that proved that. And what are the things that make that process up that could make it better? And so, as I said, there's been a winding road, I think, of about 15 projects that I've been involved with since then. Um, you could almost say that, well, you didn't get it right the first time, so you had to do it 15 times to get it right, and that maybe is the case. But there were many different places to nibble away at this topic and by a number of different funding sources as we went through here, and I'll kind of explain that. And I'm going to give you kind of the big picture because I could go into the details and we would be here till about 11 o'clock tonight or maybe 11 o'clock tomorrow morning and we probably don't want to do that. So that's really kind of a real quick background. If I, if I was able to tell you that for a project you're involved with, if I could tell you the things to do to have a more mature and accurate front end plan, that you would have better cost performance statistically than those that have poor, mature, poor maturity and poor accuracy, and that difference would be 24% on average, statistically significant, would you listen to me? What happened here? All right. I can see it on my screen, so I'm not sure what happened. Don't you li love live television? Yeah. <laughs> um, so if I told you that, and I'll just t continue to talk till we figure this out. Um, and I told you that you could get 24% better cost performance, you'd probably be pretty happy with it. And so in order to be able to measure that, first of all, you have to measure the factors that impact good front end planning, the maturity and accuracy, and you also have to measure what success is. And we measured both of those and we were able to see it. And this is a, a recent uh, project that we were involved with. By the way, um, as a question that many people ask me, why is your name spelled EDD? I'll do some jokes while we're waiting here. So, um, and, and I have a lot of answers to that. I'll give you the real answer, but um, my, I go by my middle name, which is Edward, and my parents were pacifists. They took war out of my name. Uh, put up, bump, bump, right? Um, I do a lot of risk management, and I just keep a contingency D for those times when it's most needed uh, and I we actually are back to the very front here we'll get, hopefully that makes it work
And um, my real name is, my, my dad was Ed, Eddie, and I'm little Ed. So that was kind of the, the real thing. So let me talk through here real quickly um, as, as we go through here, because if you have to measure maturity and you have to measure accuracy, then that's not an easy thing to do. And so over time, we, we started looking at um, the front end planning process from a multi-dimensional perspective. The first dimension, obviously, maturity. The second dimension, accuracy. And I'm going to kind of lay out what I mean by both of those in the context of, of, of pictures. Uh, one of the pictures that's not shown here um, is a picture of a father and a son, a father and a wife holding two young children, holding their hands, and just standing there. And let's see if we can get this back. And you, can, you can visualize this anyway. All right, I'm getting it. All right, so you, you get the picture. And so as parents with children, one of the things that we want to do is we want to make sure that they grow physically, <clears throat> they go, grow mentally, they grow emotionally to the point where they can become good contributing citizens to our society. And that's really what we're talking about in terms of a project. We want to grow that project, that front end, to the point where it's mature enough that it can get into that design process and get through that execution process and be successful. And so it is how much has been done. It is where are we in terms of the work that must be done in that front end planning process. Now what we found is that's generally about 30% of the design work, but it's also a lot of the project management um, precursors that help us get there and become successful. We also put our teams in an environment, and that environment um, is something that impacts their ability to develop accurate results in the plan and plan. And so I put this nice picture, it's of a fjord in, in Norway, but if you were having to survive in this environment, you have to cross the water, you have to climb the hills, it's not easy by any means, but <coughs> excuse me. But in this environment, the, the actual um, weather is pretty nice. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Picture yourself in this environment. What do you do? I mean, as a team member, you're in an environment that's very stormy. Things are coming at you in all different directions. You're not given enough time. You're asked to put together a plan. And what do you do? You batten down the hatches, <clears throat> try to survive, do the best you can, you know, put the work in that needs to be done and call it good. And so if we put together an environment where the team is not allowed to become successful, it doesn't have enough time to do its work and so on and so forth, then we end up in a situation where we don't have a very good uh, effort in the front end. <clears throat> so, we have choices, and we have a choice. And the choice, obviously, is do we do front end planning or not, but they're all kinds of choices that must take place as we go through that front end planning process. And that's really what the talk about is today. And we'll get to that as we come through. So it's a range of different things that we can actually do as we move forward. All right. So some key beliefs that we discovered a number of years ago, and, and I think you can look at this from a project management perspective. Excuse me. <clears throat> My voice was fine all day. It's always Murphy's. Murphy's always around. We can be competitive in a lot of things, and we can be competitive if we're able to manage those variables that impact the project. And that's not only in the front end, but it's also through the design process and into the, into the future. This early project planning, and I'm going to define that in a few moments, is essential in producing good projects. And I'll show you some data. And I've had a chance to um, see that over the years. And then finally, the last piece that many times is not well understood 
and we've seen this over and over again, the client, the owner, the user has to be involved in that front end planning process. In fact, they take on an essential role in making sure that our plan is effective. And so the choice is do we do front end planning or not? And I'll show you how that works. But it's also do we get these people engaged in the right manner when we work our project? The industry's changed over the last 30 years and, and it's interesting how it's changed and that's one of the things that, that we see. So it's a matter of choice, but a play on words, it's also a matter of choices. So I'll give you a few of those as we move forward here. So let me talk real quickly about the front end planning process and the life cycle of a project. I'm not going to bore you too much, but I think it's good for us to get a, a central basis of where we're discussing and then we can kind of talk through what, what it happens as we go. So this is the definition of the front end planning process that <clears throat> we came up with in 1994 at CII, Construction Industry Institute. And I'll point out, and I did a few words I think that are important. First of all, that planning process, which is the precursor to design, it's the initiation of the project through the, to the detailed design process, is a process, which is nice. We can measure it, we can write things down about it, it's not at the tactical level, it's not at the detail level, it's at the strategic level. We're making big decisions, trying to minimize our risk as we go through the process. Um, it's where owners must be engaged. As I said earlier, that's one of the tenets that we found that is critical to the success of a project. And as we go through that process, and, and many times it's a cascading process, we start out with literally many, many different options. We start making decisions until we've narrowed it down into a scope of work that can actually be built. Sometimes the best outcome from front end planning is that we do not build a facility. And I'll get to that in just a few moments. Planning is not new. I'm going to give you several things as we go through here. This one's out of the Bible 3,000 years ago. <clears throat> I can show you quotes from many, many different cultures around the world where people talked about planning. As soon as they started writing things, they started talking about planning. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is one by Winston Churchill, I think, and, and maybe he copied it from somewhere as well, but it was something to the effect of, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. You may have heard that before. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower said something to the effect of, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. I kind of like that one because I, I understand where that fits in as well. So we talk a lot about planning and, and we've written a lot about it. So the question is, why don't we do a very good job of it in many cases? These are some of the aliases. So as you kind of go through this process, if you've been involved in, in the early planning phases of projects, you probably use some of these terms. I'm going to talk about it and call it front end planning as we go through the process but you may just substitute your words into it to make it happen, right, as we go through this, this process. So, <clears throat> 28 years, I mean, I know this sounds like, gosh, you're going to narrow this down into three ideas. Took a long time to figure this out, and maybe I'm a little slow on the uptake, but there are three big ideas that we need to really consider and get through while we're doing that front end planning process. They're not easy, but there are three big ideas. Are we building the right project? It's not an easy thing to answer. That means, is it the right economic choice? Is it the right choice for the environment? Is it going to be operable? Is it going to be maintainable? Is it going to be something that we can um, eventually dismantle at the end of its time. All those kinds of questions that we're looking at in terms of what we should do. And at this stage, in looking at are we doing the right project, this is a time when projects should be killed, when they should go away. Because I, I've talked to many, many com companies and every company who's done a lot of projects will tell you that they built projects that should never have been built. And I think every society has those as well. It's when we don't ask the hard questions in the front. So that's the first of the big ideas. The second is to scope the right things during that front end planning process. 
So <clears throat> in order to scope the right things, we have to know what those things are. And over the years, I've spent a lot of time in three different, build, in three different sectors, heavy infrastructure projects, building projects, and heavy industrial, where we've actually looked at what are the things that we should scope out to be successful. Um, some of the things that are pretty obvious, uh, many times we don't do a good job of understanding the geotechnical conditions. We don't understand what the environmental concerns and considerations are on the, on the job site. If it's a building, we may not really look at what the requirements functionally are for the project, or we don't look at the, um, the space planning issues. If it's a highway or a rail line, we don't look at the horizontal and vertical uh, alignment very closely. Uh, we don't look at our permitting requirements, our governmental requirements, and so on and so forth. There are lots of things that need to be scoped to a certain level so that our design team then doesn't have to go back and continue to answer, ask the same questions as they move forward. And so that's a handful, but it's, it's still there, and I'll show you a few of those as we go through the presentation. So are we doing the right project? Have we looked and investigated those things in the scope to try to reduce our risk and understand how much this thing is going to cost us? And then the last piece is, you know, do we set the stage for successful execution? One of the real downfalls I've seen with many projects we've looked at over the years is that we don't even think about how we're going to execute or deliver the project until we get into that phase. Very much too late. One of the things that we see many times is that this whole idea of trying to commission and start up a new facility is an afterthought. Anybody ever have that happen to you? It's not a good feeling when your project is at the very end and suddenly you're trying to figure out how to turn the switch on. And so what we would like to see is that we set the stage for successful execution in that front end planning process. And I'll talk about a few more of those things as we move forward. The process that we see most people ascribe to in front end planning, and we published this a number of years ago. Um, I've seen it published in a lot of other places, but it was probably some 20 plus years ago is a phase-gated process. Some people call this a cascading process. The reality of it is we go through certain phases on the project as we like to do that so that we can actually stop and look at different gates. So phase gate one, we would look at our feasibility. Phase gate two, we would look at concept, and then we would detail our scope out. At this phase right here, phase three, that's generally about 25 to 30 percent of our design effort is complete. So design has to take place in the front end, and that design can be architectural design, it can be civil engineering design, it can be process design. It, it comes in a lot of different forms, but it's design nonetheless. If we're doing design, that means we're going to spend money and resources. But what we're trying to do is, is get a handle on what this thing is going to eventually look like when we get down to the very end. I didn't put a cost influence curve. I know you've probably all seen the cost influence curve. Many more options up front. As we move through the life of the project, the options go down. The cost of changes go up. You've seen that in, in place. So that's the process. Now, it's not nearly as clean and concise and, and neat and nice as this diagram looks. Many times there are feedback loops and we have to go back and we have to change and we stop and we go back because we haven't done everything we should go do and so on and so forth. I've seen in the oil and gas and mining industries there's actually a pre-phase that deals with the reservoir exploration or proving of, of things. Many times there's a business phase where we're looking for marketing opportunities. So there's all kinds of things that happen here. But this is generally the process map that you see most organizations go for if they've got a defined front-end planning process. So the question, we've talked about the planning. Now let's talk about why we would want to do front-end planning. And that goes back to that early question I asked you. Do certain, why do certain projects do much better than other projects? And that was one of the essential questions that we wanted to answer as we started this research years ago. 
We've answered it multiple times with multiple sectors and multiple looks at different things, but the answer is always pretty clear. If you do good planning, just like the old adages say, just like the old uh, quotations say, if you do good planning, you're going to do better in terms of your project performance in many different ways. Um, <clears throat> if we look at, at cost and we look at schedule, these are different samples that we've pulled over the years and statistically significant differences between subsamples that were well planned versus poorly planned based on a certain metric that we took, 6 to 25 percent. Most of them are up more around the 15 to 25 percent, 6 to 39 percent on schedule performance. And these are versus the baseline cost and schedule at the end of the planning phase versus the final actual schedule performance when you, when you finish the project. Right. I didn't put in here, but we've actually looked at operability, we've looked at safety, we've looked at customer satisfaction, we've looked at many, many different measures, and in most cases, there's statistically significant performance improvements if we do certain things during that front end planning process to be successful. So the data are out there, where do they come from? Almost lost my heart started beating again when it went black. Um, we've looked at over $125 billion worth cap completed capital projects, over 1,300 projects in the last 28, 29 years. So big samples, usually some, in some of the cases these samples were randomly selected, in other cases they were convenient samples, looking at different slices of the industry for different parts of these studies but lots of projects. So I've had a good chance to take a quick, close look at a lot of projects over the years with, with a number of colleagues and students. Um, this number is more closer to about 400 companies now. It's closer to 400 than 300. We've looked at that many organizations and their planning processes and gotten data from them and gotten information from them through surveys and so on and so forth. So Big body of knowledge, three big ideas have come out of this. Let's do the right project, let's scope the right things, let's set the stage for successful execution. How much does it cost? Again, rules of thumb, what we found was that to do effective front end planning, about one and a half to 5% of the total project cost would get you to good or effective front end planning. So an example, a hundred million dollar building um, or hundred million pound building would cost somewhere probably around two or three million pounds to do an effective job of front end planning. And that for every pound expended in an in a number of these studies that we went back and looked, you're going to get three to ten pounds back in performance improvement. That's a pretty good return. I would like to have that return with my money, and I think most of us would. You know, at the end of the day, all of this planning stuff, everything that we're talking about in the front, eventually gets done. Sometimes it gets done two, three, four, five times, right? And that's the real problem that we see because it delays things and it costs more to do it. All right, so a few years ago, one of the things that we wanted to do was kind of come up with the rules of front end planning. So I've, I've come up with the rules. Here's uh, a definition of a paradigm, you know, a typical example, and so on and so forth. The idea that we could look across a spectrum of projects, and we did that, and figure out what were the important components that make most projects do better than other projects. So I'm going to give those to you. And again, probably they sound kind of high level, but I can give a few examples as we go. So, and I used a little referee over there. We ended up writing this up, and I think the name of this was Front End Planning, Break the Rules, Pay the Price. <coughs> a little bit more water here. Um, the reality of it is we probably should have changed that and said um, adhere to the rules and you'll get 
a big benefit. We were being negative, and positive usually sells more, um, ice cream and those kind of things. So we probably should have been a little more positive. So let me talk through these real quickly. And, and again, you've got to think about how we were looking. We were looking at projects and organizations that were more successful with their projects in the one hand and less successful in the other. We did um, pairs of projects from organizations that were uh, doing projects. So we were looking for a project that was less successful and more successful. And here are the things that we found. <clears throat> one, that those projects that were more successful <clears throat> followed a defined front-end planning process and they, actually, they had one and they actually adhered to it. <coughs> We found that those projects that used the right tools during the front-end planning process, and that's not only decision support tools, but also simulations, cost estimating packages, and those kinds of things were more successful than those that just felt like we're going to do planning, we'll put a few words up on the board somewhere, and that's it. <clears throat> those projects that were diligent about looking at the existing conditions of the sites that they were getting ready to go, go to, whether it was a, a brownfield site or a greenfield site, if they diligently looked into those site conditions, not only the geotechnics and hydrology and all those engineering terms, but also looked at the political issues, looked at the uh, requirements for code and so on and so forth, those projects were more successful than the projects that didn't do that. We found out that those projects that really put the contracting strategy together that was best that best met their needs were more successful. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I've got allergic to something here or something. So, in other words, if I want to go fast, then I probably would prefer to do something this design bill so I overlap. I want to reduce my risk, in many cases I might go a traditional design bid build type arrangement and so on and so forth. <coughs> Those projects that were more successful, the project teams were aligned toward a common goal, but they were also aligned with management. And many times that vertical alignment's missing when you have projects that go off the tracks. So we saw that. We found that projects that were new, different, as it says here, new technology, when the project team realized that and put the right people in, engaged in that and did more time in understanding what those projects were about, they were more successful. Some people just felt like, hey, we've done a project before, it's something new, <coughs> excuse me, then we can actually just make this a reality. Oops. Team building, pretty straightforward. Projects that had good team building and good teams performed better. If we had the right people and the right experience in the right places, the projects went better. And then we found out that leadership, I know it's kind of a, um, <clears throat> something that everyone throws out, but when we looked at leadership, we found that those projects that were more successful had better leadership at the executive level and also at the project level, both on the owner or client side and also on the contractor side. So the, the nine rules are things that we observed over the period of time that, that actually provided uh, value for for the projects. How many of you have had or been on projects and you don't have to raise your hand, you don't have to smile, and how many of you have been on projects where you broke some of these rules? Probably so. And usually it comes back to pay as you get forward and further into the process. So we run run into those all the time. If you don't follow these rules, you might end up at this train station. <coughs> Um, and that's not the train station that we want to be at. All right. 
Jackie said earlier, I'm an engineer. And when we started doing this research years ago, I was like, okay, so I'm an engineer. This is 10% people, 90% technical. We can figure all this out technically where we are. I'll say today that I'm a recovering engineer. I go to in Engineers Anonymous trying to get all that engineering logic. I still have it but I want to get it away from myself because I realize that this is really the answer here. It's 90% people and about 10% technical. There are very, many te very few technical things we can't solve in the planning process. It's the people things that get us into trouble. And if you go back to those nine rules, most of them were people things at their root cause. And that's really what we're talking about here. All right, so I'm going to move forward. I've talked about the people side, the rules, all those kinds of things. I want to talk about decision support tools in, in, a, in a project that we did recently, and, and then we'll have a, a chance for some questions. Go through this pretty quickly. Um, over the years, we've developed about 11 front-end planning tools. I'm not going to cover all of them. In fact, I'm only going to cover, like, one. But you can do all this research. But if you don't take the research and put it into the field where people can use it, then what good is it? And we actually, I, I really ascribe to this term use-inspired research. In other words, we look at the problems, we do the research, and then we take it to the next step. So we developed 11 tools. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. We, we actually, an HTML pro process, we've looked at an overarching guide on how to do front-end planning. We've looked at alignment. Um, we've looked at a risk management, risk analysis during the front-end planning process and so on. We've looked at renovation projects, what's different about a renovation project. We spent a lot of time talking about the details of all those. The tools that are out there that a lot of people know about are the PDRIs or Project Definition Rating Index tools. I don't know if anybody here, has anybody here heard of those or used those at all? We've got a few that have done that. And <clears throat> over the years, we've developed five of those, a suite of five of them. Uh, one for built commercial buildings, one for infrastructure type projects, one for industrial projects, and then small projects versions for industrial and infrastructure. <clears throat> Input of over 7,000 years of experience into those projects when we develop those tools. And you know, that's one of the numbers I pulled out when we were looking at people who are involved in those industry-based teams to develop these tools, and then the workshops that we conducted to actually uh, fill in the information. It turned out to be over 7,000 years. <clears throat> we haven't been building things very much longer than that, at least in recorded history. So a lot of experience went into these things very much trying to get the industry knowledge and, and background. So I'm going to talk real quickly about a study that we're just finishing up. It's Project Definition Rating Index Industrial 5.0. So it's the fifth generation of the PDRI Industrial. PDRI Industrial was initially developed in 1996. It's focused on heavy industrial projects such as refineries, chemical plants, power plants, um, heavy manufacturing and so on and so forth. And so we've combined maturity and accuracy going back to the making sure that we have a maturity and making sure that we understand and the environment our team is in to be successful. And I'll show you a few results from that. I'm not going to really spend a lot of time on this. We, we went out as we always do in the CII and industry focused, team, focused research projects. We go out and get a lot of information, right? And so you can kind of read through this. We ended up with uh, almost $9 billion worth of completed projects and then another $5 billion or so worth of projects that were used these tools in process. So we tried these out on uh, a lot of projects and we looked at them around the world. I didn't mention earlier that data that we've collected over the years has come from over 40 countries and six continents. So we've actually gone out and captured data around the world. So what I've found is a lot of these truths apply no matter where you are on the planet. <clears throat> I'll just put this one up here just so you can kind of see. I mean, this is the input that we get in these development activities. 
you probably have worked with some of these companies or know of some of these companies. So there's a lot of input that goes in to developing any of these tools, which is kind of a, a neat thing for me because I get a chance to um, interact with people from all over the world and all over the industry looking at what is important in the front end. So anyway, one of the things that we looked at in this process was this idea that there's an engineering or design component in front end planning and then there is quite a bit of other things involved in the front end planning process and I'll illustrate this. This was our definition of, of a common term used in the industrial arena which is um, <clears throat> commonly used in the wrong way and we came up with an overarching definition it's the work performed front end engineering design or feed you'll hear the term feed all the time and everyone mean, meant something else so we came up with this definition but I like to show it because this is the design component of what we're talking about in the front end plan that could be front end architectural design that could be front end civil engineering design but there's design that's kind of the cog in the wheel that we see here um, it fits in with this front end planning process usually in the detail scope we nail down a lot of these things about scoping the project the design part and it both informs and is informed by different things that make up the project definition package. So if I'm putting together a project definition package, i.e. the scope of a capital project, it's going to have the design, but it's going to have all these other things floating around it. The cost estimate is informed by the design, the design is informed by the cost estimate. The schedule is informed by the design, the design is informed by the schedule, and so on and so forth. And this is why it's really a complicated process. Because as we go through all of these things, we're trying to come up with the best idea that we can to move forward for a successful project. At the end, we're generally held to, this success, to two or three success metrics. Did we meet the schedule? Did we meet the cost budget? Is it safe? And sometimes it deals with, you know, how did it perform when we started it up? And this information really is the critical linchpin of, of making sure that you actually meet those performance indicators. If we have poor front end engineering design, then many of the things that are listed here, like the work breakdown structure, cost estimate, and so on and so forth, is going to be in a situation where it's not terribly um, uh, well defined and that's one of the things that we see as we move forward. Out of this project definition rating 5.0, 46 of the 70 elements deal with um, engineering design. There's 70 total elements so those other 24 elements deal with uh, other er areas of definition and maturity. This is an example of one of 70 of the elements that you have to look at to get a well-defined project for industrial. You'll notice over to the left there, that's the description of what we should do in terms of water treatment requirements for an industrial facility, including some comments. That's a new add to this. And then across this way really is the maturity. And so uh, maturity level one means that we have done everything that we need to do from a scoping perspective on water treatment. Definition level four means that water treatment requirements are being identified. We re have really just started what we should do. For all 70 of the elements that make up this tool, we've actually gone through and we've got a description of where you should be <clears throat> at the end of the front end planning process. Where you should be at the end is at one or two the best available. If you leave things out then you're not as mature as you could be. It doesn't mean you can't move forward, it just means the maturity level is not there as we move forward. So that's really the tool. There's a score sheet that goes with it. You rank this thing, it gives you a score that, that spits out at the end and it tells you number one is your design mature enough, your feed, in this regard. 
And it also gives you a total PDRI score, which is a lower score, that tells you is the entire scope definition package in good shape. So it gives you, or gives the user an indication, have they done enough or not enough? And that's really the basis of the PDRI, right? It's a decision support tool. It's a lot of choices. We have to make choices of how mature everything is and how much we're planning on moving forward. These are the top nine industrial project maturity elements. Um, if you've worked in the heavy industrial arena, these are very familiar to you. Each one of these, by the way, actually has a diagram that looks something like this. And that's the input of probably about 1,500, 2,000 years of experience that went into that. We also looked at factors that impact not only the maturity, but also the level of accuracy, the environment. Remember the hurricane? And so there are 27 of these. There are four types of factors. This is one of 27, the project leadership team accuracy factors. We also have a project team accuracy factors. We also have resource accuracy factors, and we have process accuracy factors. There are 27 of these. We evaluate each one of them. For instance, this one, we've got a description of what it is to the right. We evaluate it based on is it high performing, meets most, meets some. Again, as a project team, I can go through this evaluation and I know where my gaps are, where I need to beef up my team, for instance, or where I need to do more work in the scope. Kind of nice. Um, these are the top five factors. Some of these are probably pretty familiar no matter what kind of project you're involved with. Should read those for a second. You can kind of see them. And then we put all that into an Excel spreadsheet. And that's really kind of the tool in a nutshell. So kind of getting to the end here, what does this mean for you? And I could spend a lot of time, as I said, on a lot of these. But we go through the 70 elements. We look at the 27 factors. That gives us an indication of how accurate and how mature our scope is. We get, a, we get a printout or a spit out, that's the maturity, the feed maturity, which is the, the engineering design maturity, and the accuracy. These are 33 projects, about almost $9 billion worth of projects, and you can see that we're actually able to measure maturity and accuracy and plot them in a, in a matrix. Lower left, low maturity, low accuracy, not really a good place. We actually came up with uh, uh, hurdle rates in terms of maturity and accuracy based on statistical analysis of these projects. We found that those projects that were down in the lower left on average were 22% above their baseline budget. Not a real good place to be. Those that were high maturity, low accuracy, in other words, they had accuracy issues, but they had maturity we're 6% above budgets, a lot better, maybe not where we want to be. And then we found that the high maturity, high accuracy were 2% below budget. So there's a 24% difference there. We also put in another $5 billion worth of projects and we were able to, um, to plot those in that same form. So we have a way of measuring accuracy and maturity in that front end plan and that can lead to improvements and gap analysis as we move forward. So that's kind of the tool. So the research went from all this and came down to the details of how to get to the end. Oh yeah, so maybe we can identify what's wrong with the project a little better than we have in the past, right? In that regard. All right, let me talk real quickly about front end planning in the future and then we'll end it up for question and answer. Um, a lot of people ask, you know, where's front end planning going? Because it is a people process and it is a, a standard process. Um, I think one of the places where technology really can help is in condition assessment, whether it's underground, integrity of systems, and so on and so forth. We looked at that a few years ago and uh, came up with a list of 29 technologies, I think, is at, the, at the time, excuse me, 24 technologies at the time, and they're listed down the left-hand side. So certainly technology is going to become a bigger player in helping us understand what we need to do in the front end planning process. And so I'm not going to stand here and tell you that it won't. 
I mean, 3D laser scanning has been huge in front end planning because it gives us that spatial relationship and understand, especially for renovation projects, for instance. So there are a lot of technologies out there that are coming on board that are going to be positive for the, the planning process in the future. I certainly think that the, the ability to do artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, 4D visualization tools and those kinds of things, it allows us to try different scenarios. It allows us to mine information from the past and hopefully understand things that have gotten us into trouble in the past. And I think that's going to be a big help for planners of the future. Um, the whole idea that we don't have <clears throat> as much of a workforce as we had in the past, and we have that problem in the U.S. as well, we're seeing much more factory solutions and modularization. That allows us to skirt or, or quickly figure out pieces that can be put together for certain types of projects, and that helps in the planning process. I think the, the idea of the platforms that we're using today have gotten to the point where we can, we can actually globally team now. We didn't have that before, and then certainly we can do a lot of simulation and decision support. So I think the, the ideas that we have with the project is, is there. I'm going to skip through this one. So in the end, from my perspective, and this is my quote you can put out there, it's still about the people and decisions. If we have better data, then we make better decisions, or we should make better decisions. And I think what's happening now in the industry and what's happening in the future is going to allow us to do that. So, whew, PowerPoint poisoning. I don't see anybody falling back in the back back there. Um, quick summary. Planning is still not new, even from the very start of the presentation. Um, you know, this is another one from Sun Tzu, uh, The Art of War. I mean, we've known planning is out there. It's unfortunate that we don't do a better job on many projects. We know why to do it. This is my cowboy riding away in the sunset in Arizona. We know what to do. I think it's pretty clear. We know when and how. And so it really gets down to choice. The choice to actually do the things that we've discovered over the years and we know that are industry best practices, to push back against people that don't want to do those things. So better maturity in front end planning. If we're running a race, we want mature, well-trained athletes running that race for us. Or we can just play it out like that, right? We don't get to the finish line quite as fast in that regard. And I think that's the piece that we see. We want a team environment that is challenging. Or do we want a team environment that's downright discouraging? And we see that so many times. There are 27 factors that go into that as well. So we make our choice and their consequences. And they're the consequence issues. And what I would say is that, you know, that's a consequence of how projects were planned that we saw in our research. And I could show you a number of other studies that have similar results to this. This is recent results. All right, so it's a matter of choice and choices. It's no mystery. Sometimes there's magic. And when a team comes together and it does the mature thing with the scope and you have the right team together, it's pure magic and projects perform very well. And if you've been involved in those projects, you know what I mean. It's, an, it's a fun experience and you get the project that everyone wants. It's not easy, never will be easy as we go through. All right, so I've run out of time and voice. So we have a few minutes for questions. Um, does anyone have a question? And we got a, we got a microphone somewhere here, right in the back. We got a question up here in the front. <clears throat> Yes. Uh, yeah, um, I was trying to read as quickly as I could the list of um, participants in your study. So yeah. Companies, that's the at the top, and that much. Yeah. But I think uh, my recollection was that uh, a lot of those companies were uh, private sector organizations. So uh, I think I spotted a water company in there that might have been a public sector one. But really, my question is around the. Um, uh, 
uh, whether in your work you've noticed uh, perhaps a, a difference between the important front end planning between private sector and public sector organisations. My own perception perhaps being that if you're a private sector organisation, you're very driven by the bottom, the bottom line, and perhaps a, a great determination to ensure that you do the right project uh, from a business case point of view, um, because the shareholders are really going to have to pick up the tab. Mm -hmm. Except that maybe the extra money comes from the taxpayer. So, I mean, have you noticed any kind of trends or differences um, between public sector and private sector funding and planning? Um, we've looked at, I think, the U.S. Department of Energy is there, Tennessee Valley Authority. Um, so there's, there's some in that list. And again, this is a list of heavy industrial um, owners. We've also looked at a number of public sector owners over time. I think you're onto something there a little bit. I think, um, but, but I've seen private companies who don't do very well in the front end as well. I think... Part of it is a knowledge of how to do the planning. Part of it is, well, it's not really my money. You see that sometimes. Um, one of the things that, and I've worked with many of our agencies in the United States, and um, sometimes the process gets in the way because we may do a plan and then we have to wait for some approval that's perhaps years in the future. Um, or we're, we have a set budget that's given to us and we have to try to figure out. Now you can still, you still have to plan if you've got a set budget, you have to plan to that budget. And in fact, it, maybe it's even more important at that point. But I think sometimes the funding process gets in the way in that. Uh, sometimes the turnover gets in the way because you see in many governmental agencies, at least in the U.S., and I've, I've kind of seen this here too, there's a lot of turnover. Um, so you end up in a situation where someone started a project, now you've got another person, another person, another person. You don't see that quite as much in the private sector, even though you do see it. And what happens in any time there's a, and that's one of the accuracy factors, by the way, is turnover that, that's in that list. Anytime you have a, a turnover of personnel, you suddenly have a break in logic and a break in, in uh, focus and you have to really work hard to overcome that. And so, I mean, I, I couldn't stand here and give you the all public sector projects are poorly planned and all pu private projects are well planned. Um, I think that it, it really is a, an interesting dynamics. I've seen some extremely well planned public projects. Um, and those are generally by people that actually ascribe to doing good planning, good and, and you can have a well-planned project and still screw it up, right? Um, so you still have to continue on with a lot of that, that stuff. So it's a good question. Um, I don't have a definitive answer for you. And I couldn't give you a percentage-wise either. I just don't have it. No, we looked at, we tried to look at that. It's very difficult to get the data, right? Uh, but I've looked at a lot of public projects in the U.S. and... I've seen really good ones and some that weren't so well and well planned, even within the same agencies, even at the same time frame, even with the same senior leaders. It's, um, it's kind, of, kind of fascinating how that works. Um, some people just don't believe in planning. So. There was a question. Mm -hmm. Yep. Do you think it's possible to be an effective planning on the basis of objectives only, or is it more effective to wait until the scope has been fleshed out through to requirements? Yeah, so I think that it's an iterative process. I think you start out with a set of objectives. And sometimes as we scope the project out, the objectives have to change. Sometimes we scope the project out and we get more information and we decide that we just don't want to do the project because we can't meet objectives. Uh, sometimes we lower our objectives or sometimes we adjust them because they weren't very, um, the objectives were not terribly um, optimum to begin with. I think, um, you know, it, the, the process I showed was a linear process. It's never a linear process. It's a, it's a, Feedback, cascading process. Um, I sometimes show a slide um, 
and talk about how chaotic it can be in planning, especially early, because lots of different ideas are floating around. Um, it's kind of like we're building a bridge across a, a river, and sometimes we start the bridge this way, and then we have to back up and go this way. And not only that, we have people who are, um, who are finance and business and operational people who are trying to talk to engineers and architects. And so you have to understand both languages. So we're, we're kind of, in some cases, people just don't understand the other side's language. So it's a, but objectives are very important. It actually is one of the elements that make up the PDRI, setting a set of objectives for construction. So you, you look like you have another questions. No. Okay, all right. Yeah, we've got one back in the back there. Two back. Two back. Um, so I just had a question around how you envisage the uh, tool being used. Is it something that forms part of a, an assessment on a project where you're seeking assurance that it's you know, suitably suitable, suitable to go up that, that point yeah. in time? Or is it something that project teams use on an ongoing basis to make sure they develop the, the, the planning? And the, the yeah, that's always a good question. I mean, you know, one way is actually... Um, we would be using it almost as an auditing. You know, we're at the very end. And so we just take a look at it to see if it's in good shape. Um, originally the tool in 1996 was, that was the way we developed it. We made it into something that would provide an audit at the end of the, end of the planning phase. And it was a go, no go, right? What thankfully the industry took a look at it and said, whoa, this is, really a good tool for us to use early in the process and use periodically to make sure that we're guiding ourselves as we go through. Um, you know, there are 70 elements in the industrial PDRI, there are 64 in the building PDRI, there's 68 in the infrastructure PDRI. We're not saying that everything has to be perfect at the end of planning. Um, if I have something that is not as well defined as it perhaps needs to be at the end of planning, and I can take that into consideration in my schedule and in my cost estimate. I can take it into consideration in my contract with my designer. Um, I can put in additional monies into my uh, contingency to handle that if I feel like that we can't wait to get there. The, the alternative to that is that we get to the end of planning and we don't know what we don't know. And I think that's the piece that these tools have helped and it's really through this process that we've been through over the years, trying to find out what really is important during that front end planning process. And so it's an excellent question, you know, and I've seen it used in many different ways, but I like to see the tool used as an end process, maybe twice, you know, or as a, as a even as a checklist. I mean, just so that you know where you need to go. Um, I can tell you that those, elements that are in there are things that need to be done in the front end, no matter what kind of project you've got. So it's an excellent question. Somebody else right behind you. One more question. One more. And then we're out of time. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for your wonderful presentation. And uh, the question is regarding the risk. You were dwelling upon the contractors mm -hmm. and talking about the risk management. So what's your view upon the coming disruption of technology and how how that should be taken into account in terms mm -hmm. of hedging those risks in the front end plan. Because, for example, if you have energy from waste projects and some, yeah. some industrial projects which involves uh, technologies which cannot be predicted and yes. it's a really niche and in developing stages, and still the clients push upon contractors to take those contracts, and then yeah. we can see those contractors picking up the contracts and just fading down. And I'm glad you gave me a compliment. You asked me a really hard question, so I'm not just joking. So it's a great question. Um, and I think that what we see is, number one, sometimes when we look at the plan or we look at a project and we look at the disruption that potentially might happen, then we might decide not to do the project. What happens a lot of times is project teams fall in love with their project and they want it to happen, right? I mean, that just happens. So, so that's one side. I think another side, though, we see, we've seen this in many different kinds of projects over the years, especially with project control technology or heating and cooling technology or energy development technology. 
um, we can carry that unknown with us in a project. We just have to plan around it and carry it through, and we plan around it by being more flexible in our utility um, backbone and so on and so forth. The, the problem that I see with a lot of projects is we just ignore that risk. And certainly if you're going to give that to a contractor, they're going to price it that way or they're going to run away from it. And I think if we identify it as a potential risk in our project, then what we can do, what we do then is we, we carry it together and manage it as we move through the process. Um, I think, you know, in today's environment, disruptive technology is a, is a really important thing to think about as you go through that process. And I've seen it in real person myself trying to build an academic inst building uh, back at my university where we were looking at the AV technology and some of the other technologies and we put our bet on the wrong technology. Sometimes you just bet on the wrong technology. Um, I think that's the piece. The, the, the other thing we did though in that situation is we had the backbone to recover. It's going to cost some money, but that, that's just what you do. So good planning kind of gets back to Eisenhower's thing, right? Plans are worthless, but planning is everything. If we're actually looking at the different alternatives, then many times we have another pathway we can go around and we've, we've, we've nailed it down that way. So it's a, it, it's, that was a great question. And I um, had never had that one asked. It's a good one. Thank you. And that's what this evening was all about, is actually helping us to think about projects, thinking about how we should attack front-end planning. Um, Ed, thank you so much for your presentation this evening. It's been a pleasure listening to you. And it still makes me think, OK, why don't we do it then? So it's something to think about. Thank you all so much for coming along this evening. I hope you've enjoyed it also. A big round of applause for our guests, please.